Hello, everyone, and welcome to PyData Global 2021. My name is Camila, and I'm very happy to be here and be your host for this session of Lightning Talks. I would like now then to hand over to the first uh, speaker, and it's going to be Svea Maria Maya and Guzal Bulatova. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Svea Maria Maya. And I'm Guzal Bulatova. And we're both developers at SK Time, which is a unified and open source toolbox for machine learning with time series in Python. And today we want to motivate why we need SK Time, how you can use it, and how to get involved. Time series are actually everywhere. Whether you want to predict your cells for the next season, whether you want to detect anomalies in your patient's heart rate, or whether you want to predict or classify different brain states. So there are different machine learning problems that correspond to these goals. To identify the type of signal that we are observing, we can solve a classification problem. So we train a model on a set of labeled trained data, and then we use this to classify the unlabeled data. To predict future sales revenue, for instance, uh, we'll solve a forecasting problem. We'll train a model on available values, and we will make the temporal forward prediction on the forecasting horizon that we would like to use in the future. There are also a lot of other machine learning problems that we can solve with the time series data, vector forecasting, annotation, clustering, and many more. And for most of these types of learning tasks, there is already a great toolbox out there in the Python ecosystem. But this ecosystem for machine learning with time series is quite fragmented. And these toolboxes are not necessarily compatible with each other. What do I mean by that? Imagine you want to make a forecast. You have a series and you want to predict future values for these series. For this, you could use the toolbox stats models, which provides many traditional algorithms for forecasting. And the workflow looks like this. So you would first specify your model. So in this case, that would be a Zarimax model. And you would directly pass your data that you might want to make predictions for. Then you would fit your model to your data and thereby also pass additional parameters that specify your model. And then you would call predict on this fitted model with an start and an end value, um, specifying from where you, to where you want to have your predictions. On the other hand, you may want to use profit. So that's an algorithm developed by Facebook. And here you would specify your model and directly pass the model parameters. You would then call fit and in fit pass your actual data and then in predict uh, pass a forecasting horizon, which is basically indices of where you want to make your predictions. And so if you want to combine these two algorithms in one application, it wouldn't be that straightforward. And it also wouldn't be that straightforward to compare these two algorithms. And this is not only the case for these two toolboxes, but for many toolboxes that are out there in this ecosystem of machine learning for time series. And if you have these incompatibility, you may still want to do tasks that you know from sklearn so something like more complex model building that includes tuning your models or creating a pipeline or ensembles and this is quite hard if you have such a fragmented system and this is where sk time comes in our mission is to develop a unified framework that covers multiple time series machine learning problems such as forecasting classification clustering, transformations, and many others. And we do this by developing our own algorithms and also interfacing algorithms from the toolkits that you're familiar with, such as aforementioned uh, stats models, profit, and uh, SK Learn. So our ultimate goal is to make the ecosystem more interoperable and usable as a whole and we do this by providing consistent API. So this is what the example that we saw earlier would look like in SK time. While these models are still interfaced models from stats models and the profit, we are now having the unified framework. And it doesn't only make them interoperable and basically easier to use, 
but also this allows us building more complex functionality like building, for example, a forecasting pipeline. So here you will be able to plug and play different forecasters in the same user-friendly API in a way that uh, you can do, for instance, in scikit-learn. And so while we have already achieved a lot, so we have functionality for classification, for forecasting, for um, anomaly detection, and you can build an SK time um, pipelines and also ensembles. There's always something to do. And we have a new release every two months. And currently one of the goals or some of the goals that we still want to achieve is panel annotation functionality for change point detection for segmentation or for the classification of unequal length data. And that's what we need you for. SK time is not only a great toolbox, we're also a big community. We are very active and we are very happy to welcome new contributors from different backgrounds and on different experience levels. For people new to open source, we provide our own mentorship programs and also we are welcoming the interns from external internship programs such as Google Summer of Code or Outreachy. We are very happy to see you in our team. Come and join us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand over now to our next speaker, and it's going to be Sarah Schuhenger. Yeah, hello. Today, I want to present you a Python package with which you can automatically analyze the ex examined body parts in a CT image. So in the last two years, we have seen that the analysis of medical images has become more and more important. Moreover, the analysis of medical images leads to lots of new opportunities. So in this short talk, I want to go with you through the pre-processing of a COVID-19 data set. The notebook you can also find on GitHub at the Python package page or um, in the description of the lightning talk. So let's start. I downloaded the data from the Cancer Imaging Archive from the data set COVID-19 AR. I can totally recommend to you the Cancer Imaging Archive if you are interested in analyzing medical images because there you will find lots of free and public data sets. So let's have a look into the data set. We have here a normal chest CT scan, but we also have messy data in our data set. So here, for example, you find a corrupted or invalid CT scan. Here you find a CT scan where the lungs were not fully examined. Here you find a CT scan, which is reverse. And here we have a CT scan um, where more than the lung region is visible. So I have several problems with my data set, which I summarize here in the next image. And I define three pre-processing steps to pre-process the data set. So first, I want to remove all CT scans which are corrupted or invalid. Second, I want to remove all CT scans where the lungs are not fully present. And finally, I want to normalize all CT scans to the lung region if more body areas are visible. So my goal is to get in the end a CT data set where all scans are normalized to the lung region so that I'm able to further analyze COVID-19 in the lungs. So during my master thesis at the German Cancer Research Center, I developed a body part regression model and I deployed a Python package to use it. So body part regression is um, a mod my body part regression model takes a CT slice as input and predicts a single score. And this score is monotonously increasing with patient height. And it tells us where we are in the human body in an anatomical way. So for example, for a three-dimensional CT scan, every CT slice in the scan would be mapped to a score. And we would gain in the end a slice score curve for the whole CT scan. And with an additional reference table, we would be then able to automatically know from which area to which area our CT scan was examined. So for example, based on the reference table, we would know that the slice which gets mapped to zero corresponds to the start of the pelvis region. So the body part regression model, you can also find on GitHub and you can easily install it through pip install bprec, which stands for body part regression. So to sum it up, body part regression takes a CT slice as input and outputs a single score. And this score is a kind of anatomical height 
which tells us where we are in the human body in an anatomical way. So uh, the main function of this package is a function which creates for each CT scan in a directory, an additional metadata file and saves it in a normal JSON format. And this metadata file includes lots of body part related information, as for example, the predicted slice scores, the body part examined, the validity of the CT scans or the reference table. I already did that for the data set in advance because it takes some minutes, but we can have now a look into the metadata files. And with the metadata files, I'm now able to execute all the pre-processing steps. So here you find uh, the slice score curve and the predicted body part examined from the metadata file for the CT scan, which you can find below. And we see that the predicted body range is chest, abdomen, pelvis, and this also fits well to the visible CT scan. In the next example, the predicted body range is chest, and this also fits well to the visible CT scan. Here we have a very strange behavior of the slice score curve. It is not monotonously increasing anymore, and we have lots of discontinuities. Moreover, the predicted body range is none, and that's because we have a corrupted CT scan. So with the help of the curse of the slice score curve, or with the predicted body range, we are also able to detect corrupted CT scans. Here in this chart, you find the distribution of the body ranges of the examined body ranges in our data set. And we see that for most of the CT scans, the chest was examined. For some, more than the chest was exam examined, some are corrupted or invalid, and sometimes the chest was not fully fully scanned as for example, for the abdomen, abdomen, pelvis or pelvis CT scans. So now we can go through the pre-processing steps. First, we wanted to remove all invalid CT scans and that we can easily do by just removing all CT scans where the predicted body range is none. This leads us to a new distribution. The next pre-processing step was to remove all CT scans where the lungs are not fully examined. And this can be easily done by removing all CT scans where the tag chest is not inside the predicted body range. So we just need to remove the abdomen, abdomen, pelvis, and pelvis images. This leads us to the new distribution of the data set. And now we have only images left where the chest is imaged or more than the chest region is imaged. And the final preprocessing step is to normalize all CT scans to the lung region. This is a bit more complex, but not too complicated. So for that, we need to have a look into the reference table. And there are lots of different anatomical landmarks defined, as for example, nearly all vertebral of the spine, all landmarks like the lung start or the lung end. And um, here in this table, you find an example reference table from one metadata file. And this basically tells us which score corresponds to which anatomic region. So for example, what we see is that the start of the pelvis corresponds to a score of about zero. For the start of the lung, we expect a score of 44. And for the end of the lung, we expect a score of 75. And with these two score boundaries of 44 and 75, I'm now able to crop the lung region out of the CT scans. I also did that in advance because it takes some minutes, but we can have now a look into the finally preprocessed data set. So, and what we can see here in the images from the data set is that we uh, um, created a data set where all CT scans are valid and normalized to the lung region, and that we therefore are now able to further analyze COVID-19 in this data set, and that we solved our initial task. So thank you very much for your attention. You can find this notebook also in the description of the Lightning Talk or on the GitHub page, and um, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much for your presentation, Sara. I would like now to hand over to Faru, to Christian Juncker uh, Brad, Bradstrup, and yes, he's going to yes. talk about style lightweight job orchestration for data science workload. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Christian. I'm a senior data scientist at Connected Cars, and today I'm going to talk about how we solved our data orchestration workflow in 10 minutes. 
So basically, uh, around a year ago, we were where a lot of teams probably are. Uh, we were doing stuff really simply for doing our data pipelining. Essentially, we could have used cron, but we ended up just having a big while loop with all our jobs. And essentially, it says if it's if it's around midnight, it's time to run to the daily batch, do all jobs in sequence. Otherwise, we're just going to sleep. Uh, and that actually turned out to be really good for us for a very long time. We actually we processed billions of data points using this method, and it works out really well because it's extremely simple and it's extremely simple to fix. But there are also situations, for example, with dependencies that are really difficult to handle in such a situation. So we saw that we were getting more data in and we needed to do something differently. Uh, and we didn't. We looked into all the existing applications like Airflow and Perfect and all those kind of things, but we wanted something that was really close to vanilla Python, and we wanted something that we were able to fix ourselves if something really broke. Um, so we couldn't really find the Goldilocks product that we needed, so we ended up building it ourselves. Uh, a side note on our folder structure, we have a very simple folder structure. We have a single source folder, and in there are all our scripts, and every script is, uh, is located there, so it's easy to find. Um, talking about our dependencies, we have a bit of dependency spaghetti here on the right. So these are all our jobs and our, their dependencies. So every box is essentially a job that we need to do. Uh, when everything on the left are jobs that have no dependencies of their own, and everything on the right are jobs that are not dependencies for any other jobs. So essentially, you can see that in the middle, we have some jobs that really depend on a lot. Um, and somehow, we needed to handle that dependency. And, and we, we really wanted some solution that really would work in, uh, in that setting. Uh, so essentially, what we ended up with was saying every file is a, is a job in its own, right? So every file in the source folder is a job. And then we added in this metadata section at the beginning called stout config because the product is called stout. Um, and essentially, it has a job type, which matches a file in the source folder. It has a chunk size that we use for doing a task parallelization. I'll come back to that. And then it has a dependencies, which is just a Python list. And each uh, element of the list is a dependency, so another job in the source folder uh, that we can, um, we can reference. And then it has a max lag, which essentially says uh, that we need to run, in this case, we need to run job B if uh, it's more than 60 minutes since we last ran that job. Uh, and then finally, it has a main function, which essentially just says this is the entry point for executing this job. Um, so very simple. We have that in the beginning of each file, and that really defines our structure. So we don't have any predefined pipelines. We only have the files, and then they define the pipeline, so to say. Um, so if we look into what is actually the life cycle of a job, on the far left, we have our periodic scheduler, which is built on top of AP scheduler. That is a Python package, really nice Python package. Essentially, just that does all the heavy lifting with scheduling for us. Uh, it's when AP schedule says it's time to do something, submit a job, then it's going to add in a row in MySQL. Uh, we have a single table in MySQL that handles everything. Uh, so it drops in a row. Uh, and then we have a, something called the master which is responsible for just checking MySQL, saying, has there been any new work that we need to resolve? So in this case, the master sees that job A is in the queue, it's pending. So what it does is that it goes in and reads the job information from MySQL. It imports the job using import leap from the standard library in Python. It reads in the style config section, looking at dependencies. It finds, it loops over the list, reading in each individual element from the list with import leap again. And then it does that recursively until it has essentially built out the entire pipeline. Um, after that, it goes in and then it pulls out the IDs that we want to work on. And the IDs are relevant because we need to know what work do we actually need to do. In our case, it's car IDs, but it could as well be customer IDs or uh, transaction IDs or whatever. It's some kind of way that we need to map between the job and the actual work. And that's what we do in, uh, in bullet 3.3. Uh, that's essentially we have the structure that we want to execute. A depends on B, depends on C. And then we split that out using these IDs uh, to do task parallelization, essentially. So when the master has done that, we can see here we have, um, we have five or six. We have six uh, pieces of work that we need to do uh, and the dependencies between them. And then we stuff that back into the same table. And then they are essentially ready for the workers out here on the far right. And the workers are generic. They can do whatever job needs to get done. They just see the job name. They import the file using import leap, and then they execute the main function. So it's nice and simple in, um, 
in, in that way. And when they are done, they just check back in uh, with the database and saying, now I've done this work. Um, so, so for us, the last mile to production used to be uh, quite hard. Uh, now it's uh, more simple than that. We essentially just develop and test locally because everything is vanilla Python. You add in the style config section, so you define the dependencies. You uh, add the job to the scheduler if you want, and the scheduling file is just a big dictionary with everything in it. And then finally, you test and deploy. And again, uh, works on my machine is, of course, something that goes into this, but um, essentially, it's the vanilla Python executor in any sense. So as long as your cond environment or whatever you use match, then normally it also works against, uh, against production. So this really speeds up a lot of stuff for us. Um, of course, it doesn't really solve everything um, because we can have dependencies that fails due to a wide variety of reasons. And this is really one of the things that we're still working on in this, uh, in this design. Um, because uh, in this case, uh, B1, uh, the B1 job fails, and then the A0 has to fail because it's dependent on B1. Um, if this happens due to, for example, an, an IO problem with a database connection or something like that, we could retry. Uh, but if it fails due to a syntax error, for example, because it hits some kind of case that we normally don't hit, um, then we can't really retry. And, uh, and the problem we are facing here is, for example, if something depends on A, let's see that job D depends on job A, uh, then uh, job D is going to see that job A hasn't executed, so it's going to re-execute job A. Job A is going to see that the B job hasn't completed all its chunks, so it's going to resubmit the chunks in B. And then essentially that's going to fail again, if it was a syntax error, for example, and then that's going to cascade up. And then if something also depends on D, you can see how this really quite quickly can progress. Um, so we're still trying to recover how do we do that when we don't have any predefined pipelines, but everything is more dynamic, so to say. Um, and uh, uh, the best options that we have so far is either not to say we're not going to run any, every, anything that is, has a dependency uh, that has failed, uh, but that's going to stall some of our pipelines. The alternative is that we could go in and say we return some kind of error code specifying if it's a repeatable error or non-repeatable error, and then we could, we could retry in that sense. Um, but, but doing this uh, workflow where we actually have, um, where we actually don't predefine our pipelines is something that we actually found uh, very useful in, in our case. Um, so is everything honky dory and the traffic is just uh, flowing down the highway? It, we're in a much better place now with Stout, but we are, of course, not there yet. Um, there's still a lot of work that we, we are working on. We still have things that breaks. The great thing about if things break is now, so for example, in this case, if B1 breaks, we can go in, do a targeted fix, resubmit the code, and then we essentially only need to rerun what was missing and we know which was missing because we have all the execution information for the B and the A jobs. So we're only recomputing what needs to get recomputed. And that's a really nice place uh, to be in, but we still have a lot of, a long way to go to actually um, also be mature there. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, I'm available on uh, Slack for the remainder of the conference. Uh, you're also welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn if you have any questions. We're hoping to open source out at some point. Uh, we haven't really figured out how we're going to open source it yet, uh, but I'm make sure to make some noise on my GitHub. So if you want to follow me on GitHub and see the internals of Stout, you're also very welcome to, uh, to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. We have one minute and 10 seconds left. We have two questions in the chat. From Brian, question uh, for Christian. Uh, what led you to building your own system here versus other options, Airflow, ML flow, et cetera? Yeah, exactly. That's a great question. So we really felt that we we didn't want anything, like we didn't want anything big. We felt this is a simple problem and we wanted a simple solution and doing a big Airflow setup or big perfect setup with a separate server was really too much for us. So we decided trying to build our own. Uh, I would say it has been an interesting experience and I would do it again. Uh, um, but uh, but there are trade-offs and there is a lot more that uh, like there is a lot of prettification around using something like Airflow where you have a lot of other setups. But again, it's a pretty simple problem, at least in our sense, compared to what else we do. Thank you so much for answering that, Christian. We have a question from Roberto in the chat, but I don't think we can make it in 10 seconds. So I recommend that you continue the conversation in the Slack channel. Thank you so much for That's being good. with us, Christian. Thank you. Uh, I would like now to hand over to Farouk uh, Sheikh. He's going to talk about building a meta forecasting model with Profit and LSTN for time series forecasting. Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. 
So it's getting all too serious. So let me first crack a joke and then begin with my conversation. So where did all the data scientists go for camping on the weekends? I see no answer there. So they went through the random forest. Dum -dum. <laughs> so I'll just, yeah, I'll share my screen and let's just begin the presentation. Okay, so today we are going to talk about how to build a meta forecasting model with profit and LSTM. So uh, the problem of forecasting has been long existing one, and there have been multiple approaches tried by various uh, like the organizations, company to build a forecasting model. So what we have come up with uh, over here is a meta forecasting model, which essentially is a combination of profit and LSTM. Both of them are open source libraries and we are going to combine them in a smart way and generate a forecast. So let's let's have a look at the challenge that we have over here. So we have uh, we were dealing with the data from mobile telecommunication service providers, and uh, their network actually gets congested when there are a lot of num uh, the, the when there are a lot of users trying to uh, get access to the internet at the same time. And that problem has only exacerbated uh, during the pandemic when there are the demand has grown exponentially and mobile operators had to struggle with. So all you need to know over here is we are trying to forecast a real world data set and uh, the high value over here, the high value of the graph that we are going to show uh, are actually good for the network. And the lower values are the ones that are critical and that is what leads to congestion. So let's take a look at the workflow, the data pre-processing in the pipeline that we have built. So uh, the approach is quite simple. We have the raw time series available to us. And the first step that we do over here is fit profit, which has been developed by Facebook. So we fit the profit model on the raw time series that we have and just get the output from it. So step one, fitting the raw, uh, fitting uh, profit on the raw time series. In step two, we train the LSTM, which is the long short term memory on the output of profit. So whatever values profit has already fit on the raw data set have been taken and we have tried to fit LSTM. Now, the reason we do this is because profit has cleaned the data set. It has removed all the outliers and it has manipulated the data while trying to fit. So it's an augmented data source that we're trying to fit LSTM on right now. In step three, what we try to do is we fit the same model that we trained in step number two, but this time around, we fit it on the raw time series, just to ensure that the model, the LSTM model, learns from two different variety of data sources. One from the values fitted, or fitted on the data set, a raw data set, and other on the values that have been already uh, uh, the raw values, so that both can compensate and our model learns something from two different but same data source. And that gives us the final forecast. So. Uh, Let's see what, how good or bad this approach is as we go through. So I'll just go through the code very quickly. Uh, the entire uh, repository has been uploaded on the, on the GitHub. I'll share the link on Slack as well as in the chat over here. And you can feel free to go through it and let me know if you have any questions or how can we, or, or I'll be happy to hear your views as well. So let's begin with the code. So here I'm importing the, uh, all the libraries. Uh, I'm reading the data set. I've created the test train split over here, 80-20%. Uh, so 80% is the training, 20% is the training data set. These are the lows that I was talking about. These are the ones that are extremely critical for the network uh, service providers because they lead to a lot of loss in revenue. And that is what we are trying to predict. So uh, the, the accuracy of the model should be very, very high in trying to predict the lower values. Uh, so here begins the step one. We train uh, the profit on the raw time series that we have over, over here. So uh, here is the code for that. So one thing to note over here is we are adding custom seasonalities because based on my personal experience, I feel that uh, uh, Profit is not very good at interpreting the, uh, the four-year transform orders that, that applies to uh, the training phase of the model. So in my opinion, uh, it would be better if you add custom seasonalities and just set everything, to everything else uh, from the parameters to false. Uh, by that way, you can get better forecast. So over here, I have trained the model initially. You can see uh, that we have the output of the profit model, and you can see how well the profit has actually captured the trends and the seasonalities present in the data set. These are the outliers or the points that we are not interested in, the upper values. So 
uh, the prophet has very nicely neglected them for us and it has cleaned the data set that is what uh, was like that is what the step is intended for and it has done just that so over here i've just uh, broken down the learnings of the prophet into trends uh, this monthly seasonality daily seasonality and weekly seasonality over here uh, again we can see there are all three seasonalities were present and profit has done really well to capture all of them uh, so next begins the prof, uh, process of pre processing the data for lstms so now we are going to take the input from profit and fit lstm on it so here are a bunch of utility functions that just try and address that uh, but one thing that i would like to draw your attention to is the uh, this is the function specified over here which is which is uh, the architecture of our lstm model so one thing to note is there's a problem of catastrophic forgetting that we are trying to solve in doing so, uh, uh, which is like the model tends to forget when it, when we try to fit one model twice, it tends to forget what it had learned previously. So to avoid that, we need to keep the architecture of the network very, very shallow, which it shouldn't be very deep. Otherwise you'll suffer from catastrophic forgetting. So I've done that and I've linked the description. You can read, uh, I've link, lay, uh, linked the, this problem, you can read more about it uh, in the in the reference section. So here I've specified the hyperparameters that I want to tune. Uh, here I'm generating the train test and validation data splits. So here again, I'm creating those data splits and getting it uh, getting the data in the format for in which uh, the LSTMs would take it. In. So here begins the step two of the model. So in step two, we are training LSTM on the data fitted by the profit. So profit uh is the the values that we obtained we had saved them and we are training it on them so over here we can see uh, the training has finished uh, and we get the score of 0 0.25 at and the epoch number uh, after the 18 epochs so we have obtained the uh, we have completed step two of the training process now begins the step three of the training process over here we are going to retrain the same model that we that was present over here uh, and we are just going to adjust the hyperparameters this time around with the raw data set. So if you can see over here, the Keras get such parameters, I have passed in uh, the values that were saved in the previous training phase. So KGS profit is what, uh, what we obtained over here and I've passed that as the input for this step. So it begins the training again, uh, reaches the conclusion, like uh, tries to find out and then everything is automated using the Keras hypertuned uh, library that was available. So I don't need to manually uh, manually tune the network. It automatically finds the best parameters when it should stop the training process because that is something which is important and we should keep in mind uh, while while training this uh, this particular model. So over here the training has finished and now we are we are just trying to obtain uh, the predictions from profit as well as the predictions from the step three over here. Now uh, we need to have some sort of a benchmark to compare the results to. And LSTMs have been gaining a lot of popularity in recent times uh, because of their abilities to forecast as well as their ability, their, their other applications in natural language processing. So that is the model that we are going to uh, set as the benchmark. So I'm just fitting the model, just, uh, just the LSTM model on the raw data set. This is, uh, we're not training it twice we are just training it once on the raw data set which is usually the case which is usually done by all the data scientists so we do that over here and we obtain the we obtain the predictions so uh, we now obtain we completed the training and we are obtaining the predictions for the test set and these are the values that we obtain from the raw lstm the actual values and the lstm profit meta model that we have built and here i have just plotted uh, how well the uh, uh, the two, three, two models that we have performed with respect to the actual values. So we are forecasting 148 hours into the future. So on the x-axis, you can see the number of hours forecasted. So over here, you can see that visually it looks like uh, LSTM profit model has done well, but then again, to get a better understanding of how good this is with respect to the uh, vanilla LSTM model, we are going to compute the root mean square error on both the both the methods and then compare it. So here, here I've done just that. Here I've plotted the uh, root mean square error for uh, profit uh, LSTM metro model as well as the LSTMs. Uh, and you can see that for LSTM, it's 3.70 and for our meta model is 3.2, which gives us around 13.36% improvement uh, over uh, 
the vanilla LSTMs, which is quite large, to be honest. And I'm really excited that this method has done really well uh, compared to the vanilla LSTM uh, that we had. And like the entire process has been automated. So you can obtain fast, quick forecast and a reliable one just by combining two or three different methods that were available. Uh, so the problem that we had, we addressed in this pay, in this uh, notebook, I've linked it over here, the catastrophic forgetting. You can check it out. And the entire code is available on our GitHub. So I'll share the link and very happy to take any other questions you have or just uh, like let me know what you think about this particular approach. Yeah, thank you so much. Arut, you see, that was straight 10 minutes. I was already worried we were going to have more than 10 minutes. You made <laughs> it. Thank you so much. I gave yeah. you two seconds more because of the really nice joke in the beginning. Thank you so much for your presentation and for being with us. Uh, we have here some questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to answer them. I ask you to just continue the conversation in the Slack channel. We have their talks. Just yeah. ask your questions there. Just go together town, do the networking thing, you know, that would be the place for it. Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll answer all the questions from Marcus as well as Brian on the channel that we have on Slack. So I'll share the code as well as answer them over there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us. Anyone, you know, yesterday I was holding a session with the people from the Impact Program and we had so many amazing jokes, you know, like it was, I think, the best data science jokes ever. But then I didn't save the chat and then I like desperate now trying to find uh, jokes. Uh, this uh, uh, Alexander here, this one I heard from Vincent uh, Varmedan yesterday, credits to him. You know why Tesla costs so much? They charge a lot. <laughs> Thank you for that. I would like now to hand over to Abilash Babu, and he's going to talk about using uh, Scikit uh, learn models in a C, C++ application. All right. So the talk is about how to use uh, Scikit model to do inference in the C, C++ application. So the outline of the talk is that I'll go through some of the available options and uh, mostly focus on only the next. And, uh, and if time permits, show a little demo of a toy application, uh, toy C++ application that uses uh, a Scikit model inference. So if you look at the documentation for Scikit Learn, uh, it, it gives you two different ways of model persistence. One is to save the model as in the ONNX format, and the other one is to save it in PMML format. So if you are saving the model in ONNX uh, format, then you could use ONNX runtime for doing the inference, and that you could do it from a C, C++ application, and which would be the focus for this presentation. Uh, the other option is to use uh, PMML, uh, which is an XML-based format and they could use a CPMM library for inference, but uh, it's not very actively developed. And, uh, but so I would not uh, prefer that to probably ONX is better. What are the other options? Uh, you could probably convert the model into a library. For example, there's this uh, library called TreeLight. Uh, it converts a tree-based model into a shared library. Uh, the downside is that it works only with tree-based algorithms. Like random forests or distant trees and so on. And uh, another option is Hummingbird, which is another library from Microsoft. It also does something similar. It compiles traditional machine learning models into uh, tensor computations and which then you could use with uh, the traditional, uh, with the any deep learning model frameworks like TensorFlow backend or uh, PyTorch backend or even ONNX. Um, the other option could be that you use the same underlying library that Scikit-Learn uses, for example, LibLinear or LibSVM, uh, but there's no direct mapping between when, the way you train it on Python and how you use it with LibLinear on a C++ application. So uh, it, it, it might be possible to do it, but it's not, it's not a straightaway option. Uh, the other thing that one could do is uh, use the Python interpreter from C++. So you could then wrap your Python application using PyBind or Swig, and then uh, use it in the C++ application. But uh, the downside is that there's probably loss of performance because of the conversion from data types in Python and C++ and vice versa. So yeah, so these are the different options that are available. 
So we'll go on to the ONN X format. So it's the it stands for Open Neural Network Exchange format. So you could save your model uh, in an, uh, in in this particular format, which then could be used by different frameworks and for inference. So how does it look like in a C++ application? So here you initialize the uh, ONX runtime and then you create the session where you specify the model and then you create the inputs. So you create the tensor, uh, populate the inputs and do the inference and then get the output. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, now, why ONNX? Uh, because it's an open source format. It's uh, been supported by like back by all the top companies uh, working in this field. Uh, it works with all the different models, uh, frameworks, and it also runs on different, uh, a wide variety of uh, targets, like so, um, CPUs, GPUs, and FPGAs with different languages. And uh, the, the other thing is that, say, if you are working with a traditional machine learning model and you're not happy with it, and if you want to switch to, a, say, a deep learning model, you could still use the ONNX framework because it works with the other frameworks too. So that it gives you that leverage of trying out the standard machine learning algorithms as well as, um, um, say, deep learning models. So the switch would, would be easier. Uh, the PMML model, so it's a XML based markup language. So you can just like ONNX, you can save the whole model, the parameters and everything in an XML format and then use uh, one of the libraries like CPMML. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not very well supported. So but if you're into Java, the libraries in Java work very well with PMML format. And if your desktop application is say Java based, then this could be a format that you could try. Tree light, as I mentioned earlier, so it, it not only works with scikit-learn, it also works with XGBoost Light GBM. So it converts your tree light, uh, sorry, the machine learning model into a shared library, and then you can then link it in your C++ application. So uh, the, the conversion would look like this. So you, the, the normal steps involved in scikit-learn, you, you create the model, fit it, and once you're trained, you can do call the export lib and uh, provide the, the tool chain and then it converts it into say a shared object if you're in, in a Linux environment or a DLL if you're in a Windows environment. Uh, the same is the case with the Hummingbird. So you convert the whole thing into uh, different backends. So you can convert your tree-based model into a PyTorch model or an ONNX or a Apache TVM. And then you could use their backend like the PyTorch backend or ONNX runtime to do the inference. So here's the uh, screenshot of how you could do that. So, so again, the same steps, uh, create the model, do the uh, fit the model, and then you can convert it into uh, whatever backend you want to prepare it for. So uh, uh, the links to all the different uh, libraries that I've mentioned earlier, uh, it's here. And now the time for a small demo. So this, you could, could you see the, uh, Application, yeah, okay. So this is a, a C plus plus application where it, uh, you can just draw digits and it do the prediction. For example, you can uh, say draw two, and I hope it works. <laughs> yeah. So uh, or okay. Yeah. So this so this is a C plus plus application, uh, and uh, it it uh, does inference on a support vector machine model, a logistic regression, and a random forest. So you could uh, say. Uh, draw something and predict, and it'll show what it predicts for different different models. So, yeah, <laughs> not very user friendly, but so uh, so it, it uses all these different models, and uh, it uses the ONNX runtime that I've mentioned earlier in the presentation. So, yeah, that brings to the uh, brings my presentation to. Thank you so much for being with us, Ablash. Yeah, thank you. I would like now to hand over to Brian Sech Manek, and is going to talk about pointer generator summarization and explainability for legal documents. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, and yeah, so happy to be here. Um, and I guess I'll start. I'm Brian Chikmanek. I'm a data scientist at Thomson Reuters Labs in, in London, UK. And this is my first talk, so if it's terrible, please be nice, but also feel free to, um, you know, send me a, a, an angrily worded email or a Slack message later telling me what to do, you know, what I did wrong. It's always good to learn. So 
Um, also, this talk is um, also largely kind of like an industry talk around the human aspect of translating models to a human driven task. So I'm a little bit light on the techni de technical details of the models, but please feel free to ask. Um, I also have way too many slides and I'll click through them really quickly, but hopefully that will help gloss over the fact that I don't really know what I'm talking about. So um, yeah, we'll go from there. Okay. Oh, and yeah, sorry, I'm talking about point of generator summarization and explainability for labor rockets. Um, corporate stuff out of the way. Thomson Reuters Labs is the you know little startup inside of the the big corporation, like every um, company claims to have. Uh, we are hiring, and it's not a bad place to work. I will be posting in the jobs Slack channel um, as well. Feel free to mess, like message me on LinkedIn or here or something like that. Um, yeah, so cool. Awesome. So I'll spend about five minutes on text summarization and then about five minutes on explainability. Um, I'm usually pretty cool to take questions during a talk, um, but I can't quite happen to see them at the moment. So maybe, I don't know, raise a hand or shout out, but um, otherwise we can take them at the end. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll talk about the use case. So uh, most people probably know Thomson Reuters for Reuters News. But that's actually just like the tiniest part of the, part of the business. The, the largest part of it is actually products for tax and legal professionals. And one of those is called Courtwire. Um, and Courtwire is a product for legal professionals to monitor new legal cases as they arise, specifically uh, across the US. Um, and the idea is that we have to get them to publication as quickly as possible. Um, for, for people to firms to read them and kind of choose if they're going to represent cases. Um, and usually Courtwire gets stuff out kind of like two weeks before um, the, the court docket, which is a big rush, right, for, for firms. So um, the kind of workflow is that a court case is filed to the court, some 10 or long, you know, 100 page document is published. Um, we send it off to, to legal professionals, um, expert editors. They write some kind of summary about it, which is what I'm talking about, but they also extract a whole lot of metadata. And then they publish this out to our clients for them to read and they kind of choose who they want to represent for certain cases. Okay, um, what this looks like under the hood for our internal editors is they get a PDF document and they have to go through this manual task of reading the whole document um, and writing up some, you know, very exacting summary as well as um, that metadata that I mentioned. And just, you know, to be really clear in the legal field, um, the quality of these summaries is of utmost importance, which you can, you know, imagine why, because legal proceedings are usually um, very language specific and very, um, you know, situation specific. So you have to be quite exact on them. Um, and so this is the this is the kind of case that we wanted to replace, where we have this summary task, which is time consuming. And we were hoping that we could just completely automate it away, which as we know in machine learning is usually a pipe dream to fully replace people. Okay, um, so our task was pretty clear. Um, from the, the source data we had, uh, we get PDFs that are OCR'd. We have about a million historical cases as our training data set. Um, the first model was trained until about 2018 and now we're kind of updating it. So it's a bit more than that. Um, and then editors say that usually in the first 10 to 15 pages of the document, they can write a good summary. So while this is technically a long document problem, it's not a like massively long document problem. Um, and then our target is a summary is going to be kind of one to two, maybe three sentences long. The, the human cost of it is about six minutes per editor summary. So anything we can get below that is good. And uh, as I mentioned, the quality of the, the summarization is extremely important. So, you know, any model we produce has to be very good for that. Okay, um, just a really quick introduction to summarization. Most people probably get the idea of, of text summarization, but it does break down into two large um, areas. The first being um, extractive. So that's just you chip, and, uh, sorry, you, you strip out sentences or parts of sentences and you kind of mash them together into hopefully a condensed summarization. Or you have abstractive summarization, which is more kind of your like middle school book summary thing, right? Like take this long thing, generalize it into your own words, and hopefully you have just a, a shorter condensation of it. Okay, so those are the two things. Um, and I just, I have my own kind of informal rules around what a good summarization should be. Um, these are not like formalized anywhere. It's just, I think they're... Um, Good, that the summary should be shorter than the input text. It should capture the salient information. It should faithfully represent the document, right? Like you can't have non-factual information provided. Um, if something says the revenue value is 10 million, you can't say 15 million. Um, and also it has to have some kind of um, grammatical and syntactical 
properties to it that we you know would like to read as people. Okay, cool. So to do this, um, there are a lot of summarization models of kind of varying levels of state of the artness. We went with a pointer generator network, which kind of 2018-ish was a bit more state of the art. Um, it is a sequence to sequence type model which has a pointer, which improves the accuracy of the model by handling um, out of vocabulary words. So this is our extractive portion of the network. Um, and this is what gives us the factual stuff, right? Like pulling out that revenue value of 10 million um, exactly, as opposed to trying to reword it as some approximation of it, right? Um, and then there's the generator network, which again is kind of your, your summarization. And this is what gives you that idea of um, of, of incorporating uh, paraphrasing and generalization to it. And you kind of shove these together and get an extractive plus abstractive model, which is pretty neat. Um, the the kind of technical details that I will gloss over, but I really want to point out is the interesting part, is at each stage in the um, network decoding time step, you, had, you get um, within the pointer net as well as the baseline, some probability for generation to occur. And that's what this P gen is. Um, and you sum those up at the end, and that's how you balance the extractive versus abstractive nature of the network. Um, there's, a, there's kind of like a default value. You can totally fiddle with it if you want. Um, but at the end of the day, we found that when we trained it on these kind of million or so documents, we actually got pretty good machine generation. It was around 70%. Um, and then we started displaying this back to our editors. And now, you know, we thought we did a great job and here's your summary and it can speed up your time. And then all the editors came back to us saying, no, 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 um, you have this summary, but how did you get there? Like, I can't trust this. I still have to read the entire document at which stage I might as well just write the whole summary myself all over again, right? So we found that we really didn't solve any of our, our use case problem to, to write these summaries. So that gets us to explainability, that you know, we had this model that was presumably outputting something useful, um, but the, the, the editors who are not machine learning experts didn't know what was going on. Um, so now we're left with explaining this. So, um, and here's kind of the crux is I have a chip on my shoulder about explainability in AI. Whenever somebody says that um, AI models are black boxes, that's not true. We just have to you know, tease out the nuance and think about who we're explaining stuff to. Right. And as, as a, an ML person, you might want to care about, like, does it work as expected? What are the data biases? If you're a regulatory body, you might, you know, especially with GDPR, you might care about are these things um, biased? Do they comply with regulations? Or in our use case, we have an end user who wants to say, can I trust the model? Is it outputting the, the salient information? Where did you get this information from? So we said, okay, well, how can we point out to the user what is the model actually paying attention to? Um, and within the pointer generator framework, there is this attention distribution layer that you can pull out. And with a little bit of normalization, you can pull together this really nice um, uh, uh, word highlighting matrix. And from that, all we did was just overlay into the summaries where the network was actually pulling and, and generating these summaries from. So that an editor could go in and say, oh, it's at least bringing me to the place that um, these things came from. Okay. Um, and so at the end of the day, um, there's some text, but the, the point is we saved overall about 37% of, of editor time in these summaries, which was definitely like, you know, um, a, great, uh, a great time savings for us. And yeah, so that was that project. Now I feel kind of bad because I did talk about like an internal Thomson Reuters tool, but there's a fantastic open source repo called Echo um, that does a much more than what we did as well, um, where it actually gives these kind of highlights. I am running out of time. I think I have five seconds and um, please go check it out. It's fantastic. And yeah, thanks everyone for listening and maybe Q and A at the end. 30 seconds, 29 if you want to say anything else. <laughs> Oh, just my, my, my takeaway is that um, the obvious solution that full automation was like not going to happen, um, but it just the, it, it's a shift of task to what the editor actually wanted to see, which is where is the summary coming from? And I think, yeah, AI is explainable, just you have to put some effort in. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Brian, for being with us. We have some questions here in the chat. We don't have the time. 
we don't have the time to answer to them. Uh, but if you want, please do uh, continue the conversation on the Slack channel. Go there to talks and uh, please just continue there in Gather Town. Thank you so much, Brian, for being with us. I would like to hand over now to Diego Arenas, and he's going to talk about automating the exploration of databases for data science with AEDA. Aida. Thank you, Camila. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, my name is Diego Arenas. Uh, I'm a, a computer scientist. I'm finishing my doctorate in computer science uh, at St. Andrews University, and I work in data science and data engineering projects. And before that, I did a master in data science, and before that, I was a consultant in data analytics. And I had, in during all these kind of experiences, I had a recurrent problem all the time when I started a new data science or data engineering project, which was um, the customer or my new project handed me kind of a big data set or a new database that in order to create a machine learning model or uh, to design a new data, data model. So I found myself all the time doing the same tasks over and over again, like how many tables, how many columns, um, doing a lot of data exploration. So because of that, uh, of that problem, recurrent problem, um, I tried to reduce the time that I would spend querying the data and more time analyzing it. So I created this um, custom package um, called AIDA. AIDA. Uh, you can, I, I added the, uh, you can find the slides in, in this webpage. Basically, um, the AIDA, AIDA library stands for Automated Exploratory Data Analysis. Um, it works with, um, Two databases so you will have a new database that you want to kind of um, explore and understand its content and you uh, the, the package requires a second library a second database where you will store uh, all the metadata from the original database so you could have a multi gigabytes or terabyte database as a source but when we extract the metadata we turn that into megabytes so it's easily explore uh, afterwards when you kind of profile the, the database. Um, it works extracting the metadata um, and it automatically creates a data catalog uh, for you. Um, the way it works, basically it generates SQL code and it's executed on the host, on the database uh, host server. So um, if it's big enough to hold the database, to help it, to have the database, it can uh, support the queries for for exploration. At the moment, um, it um, it supports uh, these databases, but it's easily extendable. So another thing that I wanted to do is was to make it as simple as possible. Um, so the user shouldn't have to configure too much things. Um, so. Um, um, it works for MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, Oracle as well, Snowflake, and if you have a different database engine, it could be easily uh, extendable for, for that. Um, so what do you do when you start exploring a new database? Um, some ideas are to know how many tables, what are the names, how many columns, what are the names, how many rows are in, the, in each uh, table, how many unique values you have, how many null values to have an assessment of the data quality of the database, the source database. For categorical um, variables or columns, you would like probably the distribution, what are the most frequent values, what are the less frequent values. For numerical columns, you would like the average, standard deviation, maximum, minimum, different uh, percentiles like median, 25, 75, and and so on, some different um, statistic moments of the variables. And for daytime columns, uh, it would be nice to have uh, a summarization. So if you um, have a timestamp somewhere, you could aggregate that uh, by month and see trends if the data uh, grows or decreases, what are the limits, the ranges of, of the data, and, and so on. So all these things, um, the IDA library does it for you in, in, in what, what 
with a, with a single command and it generates all this information uh, and made it, make, it, make it available for you in a metadata database that you can query or connect to your, to your kind of uh, preferred uh, data visualization tool. Um, how can you use AIDA? And please do um, let me know how it goes and if you want some help, reach out. Um, I'm happy to kind of um, explain. But basically, there is a file, a database.ini file, where you define this connection. You will, have, you will need a uh, source database that you need a reading access. Um, you define the standard with the name of the database, the server, the, the, the IP in, in the host. Um, a user, a password, and you define a second database for your metadata. It could be local. If you don't have a database, it will create a um, SQLite local file in your in the repository that you clone, um, and it will store the metadata there. Uh, you will need those names. You uh, name the, the your connections. Basically, these are your connections. And then from the terminal. You just uh, need to run Python, the AIDA, this is the main file, explore, this is the command, and you pass your source database and your metadata um, database. And this will generate, will start querying the source database and generates. I've, I've explored or profiled hundreds of tables, like um, databases with hundreds and at some point with thousands of tables, and doing that manually would be um feasible but would take a long time so this is kind of a time saver uh, basically and there is embedded in the or incorporated in the in the, in the library there is a, a very lightweight data visualization uh, that you could explore the data with streamlit and basically list the tables and give you some summarization of the information that you have and it does that Based on this parameter, metadata database, yes, basically it will kind of connect there and create the visualization. The good thing is you can uh, query or to pro profile different database engines and store them uh, all together in your um, metadata database and explore all them together at, at once. Um, while using AIDA, it's a centralized metadata repository. Um, it's um, there's a lot of features to add, but uh, you could easily start exploring databases uh, with this, and then you could probably move to a more uh, uh, developed solution. But this is a kind of really straightforward start. Um, it reduces the data collection time, and you have more time for analysis. Um, you can query your different database engines without need to without the need to change. You kind of query. The data and data values from, from from your metadata database. It finds relationship between tables as well, as well as you have the domain data. So you could search the domain values for one column on the domain values of all the other columns of the other um, databases or database engines. You can have a data quality assessment for free. Um, and yeah, there's one nice feature that it finds candidate primary keys from uh, database models. Sometimes you need to find the, the primary keys, but you don't have indexes or anything. Um, and this uh, script will do that for you. Basically, we will tell you which um, columns are looking more uh, promising as candidate primary keys on, on the table. And that's very helpful for data engineering problems for CDC and other um, type of um, problems, maintainability. And uh, here, I, I'm just showing a uh, data visualization that I queried uh, 800 tables and with 5 billion rows. Um, and it depends on how much time it takes for the server to, to, to finish, but um, all the queries are sorted by row number. So it will finish the uh, small tables first, and then it will take a bit longer for the uh, bigger tables, but eventually it, it finishes and you can have something like this. This you can build your own data visualization. And for example, for timestamp values, you could select any timestamp value and see the trends uh, group by month, for example, for each for any table. Uh, thank you very much. If you want to uh, get in touch or try out, uh, please uh, instead uh, uh, create an issue on the repository um, or ask any question. Um, I'm happy to kind of get in touch and, and um, 
uh, try to tell you more about AIDA, how to use it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diego. We have a question in the chat from uh, Vivek. Does it support Azure Active Directory with MFA authentication? So the answer is planning to access connections with connection um, um, uh, to, to a key value in Azure and um, have that uh, kind of level of security. But at the moment, no. Okay. Thank you so much, Diego, for being with us here at PyData Global. I would like now to hand over to Mika Pfluger, Achilles uh, Kotsu, and Mikael Zontag. And they're going to talk about Gene at Home, run your own research data management platform. And Alexander told me before he had a joke, but I'm not sure if you want to share about it, about a favorite uh, Python library. So I don't know if you want to do it now or later. Maybe we go first with the presentation and then we have the Python joke, please. Yeah, thank you, Camilla. Um, yeah, I will uh, talk about, uh, so I'm Mika Pfluga and I will talk about uh, Gin at home. So run your own research data management platform. And so first I will tell you about the problem that uh, this solves and that what the solution is that uh, I will talk about. So the problem is, um, you probably all know that version control is great. And then the idea that you directly have is let's also put all our data in probably Git because you're doing the version control of your code uh, in Git. And that's actually something which works at first. Um, but then you quickly notice that um, uh, GitHub, where you probably have your code, uh, blocks pushes that exceed 100 megabytes and uh, it's rather quick to have a data file which is larger than 100 megabytes and even if you look around for other git hosting options um, gitlab.com for example has a total repository repository size limit so that is also not very um, not probably not enough if you have a bit larger data uh, sizes and then even if you say, okay, we will be hosting our own GitLab, um, the problem is you don't want to version control one version of your data. The whole idea about version controlling is, is that you have different versions of your data set. You iterate rapidly, like maybe multiple times a day, you change something there, and then your data set and your Git repository grows. Uh, cloning your Git repo repository will take forever and uh, also all operations will take forever. It's not actually built for this. Um, so let's see what the idea for the solution is. Um, and that is Jim. Jim is the software. And uh, what does it do? Uh, think uh, like GitHub or GitLab. It's Git hosting, but it also handles large data. And it does this by putting the metadata, so the file size and the hash of the file and the file name into Git and the data in Git Annex, which is um, another program uh, that exists uh, that is older um, that puts the data close to Git, but not in Git. And one of the big um, advantages there is that the data is only fetched on demand. So if you um, clone your data set, at first, you only get all the metadata, and then you can, for example, say, um, get me the most recent data, and you don't have to have all of the versions of the data set on your laptop. And the clients that you would then use, because, I mean, you can use Git and Git Annex directly. That is uh, possible with Jin also, but it's um, a bit raw uh, to do that. And there are more polished clients that are the Jin command line interface, Jin. CLI and data led, which is um, geared more towards uh, scientific publishing. So that sounds good to you, I guess. Uh, so when you sign up, and that depends, if you do neuroscience research data, then you actually just sign up at uh, gin.gnode.org. Um, I mean, I can show it quickly to you. This is a, a web page. You can register there. Register there. They do lots of nice things. For example, also, you can uh, get a DOI for your data if you want to. And um, 
it's recommended also by the big uh, publishers there. And just one fine print, uh, do con uh, contact the people there at Gnode before uploading more than one ter terabyte of data. So, I mean, it's not a hard limit, but talk to them before you do that. Unfortunately, you might not be doing neuroscience research. I am not doing neuroscience research. So what do we do? Well, that's uh, the real topic here. It's that you just set your own, up your own JIT, a gin. So you can set up your own gin because it's free software. And uh, it's not actually that hard. I mean, of course, you need a server. And the server needs to have uh, a lot of storage as much as, much as you want to store there. Uh, different versions. And uh, technically, this is packaged in Docker containers by the Jin people. And it can be installed, uh, all the Docker containers uh, that are necessary and all the configuration and so on using Ansible, which is a configuration management system. Um, that's the part that I developed. And when I talk here about minimal config, I will just show a fairly minimal, min minimal config that you have to write to uh, deploy your own gin. And there you can see you just write uh, on which host you want to install it. Um, you tell the name. Uh, of course, you need a domain. Uh, you have to give some uh, admin username, so the first user that will be configured. And then later, you can say if people can sign up or if you um, have to make new accounts manually, for example, for an internal installation. And, and if you want to send mails, stuff like that. There's a lot of more configuration examples to uh, uh, configuration variables to configure your own gin. Um, but I will not show all of them here now. And this is really enough to get, get you up and running. And the nice thing with Ansible is also, if you want to change something here, you just change it and rerun it. Uh, and it will change the configuration of your instance. So that's it. Um, uh, I want to say thanks to the Gin and DataLab developers. I mean, uh, I didn't develop uh, this stuff, only the installation routine. And um, you can find the Ansible role and also the documentation here, at, also at GitHub or at the Ansible Galaxy. You can find this slide at my personal page. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your talk, Nico. We have some questions in the chat uh, from Abilash. In what way is different from Git LFS? Yeah, it is um, slightly different from Git LFS, mostly in that you can use with um, the clients, for example, like DataLab. You don't have to use Jin. Um, you can also use um, other um, backends, so for example, just an SSH backend, or you can put your data into uh, large cloud storage providers. And um, then, in what the other question was, in what way it is different from DVC? There, it is more going into the um, details to see where it is really geared towards. DVC, when I looked into it a year ago, uh, was really in, um, had special features for this um, for the integration of machine learning stuff, whereas uh, Jin came more from the data science side, I would say. And um, especially data led there has uh, reproducibility features that work differently from DVC. And is it usable for data sets on the order of one petabyte? Uh, data led definitely is. So the neuroscience uh, uh, research uh, that people are doing there is done on this uh, order of one petabyte or more. But um, I haven't myself tried if the Jin web interface then also works nicely. So that is, uh, of course, something that also depends on your server. You need a server where you can store one petabyte, and it needs to be a web server, so that might not be straightforward. So you might want to use other backends there. Maybe that's also not so critical that people could download one petabyte there in their browser. Thank you. I would like now to hand over to uh, Sebastian Ernst, and he's going to talk about 
amazing things your Unix operating system can do for you, OSIX shared memory. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bastian Ernst. Um, I'm basically a self-employed slash freelance consultant, you could say, mainly working in uh, high performance computing stuff. I do a lot of geoscientific work, but also aerospace engineering work and whatever is related to that. And uh, this talk kind of came out as um, just a side result or kind of a little thing on the side, basically from a conversation I had with a couple of people and it was kind of interesting to see. So every now and then I have to dig into infrastructure when I do parallel computing and I have to solve stuff and make stuff faster as you all maybe have to. So in parallel computing, you usually have to deal with the issue of efficiently sharing data across um, parallel portions of a computation. And when you write parallel code, like one portion is computing one bit and the other portion is computing the other bit and you have to maybe exchange intermediate results. And there are different strategies for that, as you may know. So when we are working with Python, basically, we are confronted with the typical problem of the global interpreter lock. So basically, uh, you cannot really do thread-based parallelism in Python. You can do it in C, in Fortran, C++, but you basically cannot do it in Python. Sebastian, because my apologies to interrupt you. Uh, yeah. We have a request on the chat. If you can speak yes. a little bit louder uh, and slower. Yeah. Hard to hear you. No, no problem. Just take a deep breath okay. and go. Yes. Okay. So in Python, you cannot really go uh, with a multi-threaded multi uh, parallel computing task for most intents and purposes, which is essentially why you want to do, uh, use multi-processing, essentially. Going one step further, uh, well, if we are going for multiple processes, we are dealing with memory protection on modern, modern operating system, meaning that one process cannot easily share memory with another process because of the memory protection. Remember the days of Windows 95 when everything was crashing all over day uh, after day after day, this was an operating system that did not have memory protection, hence that's an issue. We typically address this within a process communication. Now, what is it? one of the typical solutions in Python is something like number, for instance. If we JIT compile stuff with number, we actually now have binary code essentially, which can again use uh, threads. Number does not care about the global interpreter lock and uh, if you're using it in no Python mode. So this is one solution. There's the P-range function essentially, which is something that you can use. Um, I'm calling it cracking walnuts with a sledgehammer. It's kind of a hard thing to do on some pure Python code, but it usually works. If you're interested in going faster, you can kind of go for the nuclear option, uh, siphon, uh, you basically take Python code, uh, convert it to C, and then you compile it. Again, there's something called a P range in here, which is kind of still Python-like syntax, but you kind of get something parallel working again, thread-based. But what about pure Python? Like how can we actually do something in pure Python, have full parallelism and still have shared memory like as if we were in threads? So this is kind of the idea here. And this is where POSIX shared memory becomes a really interesting tool to play with. And this is something that I have been exploring uh, quite a bit. So. This little snippet here, don't read it in detail, just skim over it, uh, is something I came across a while ago. Uh, it's basically four functions from libc, something that you would typically find on in Unix operating systems. System, uh, shm, get, et, dt, and ctl. And you can kind of understand them as a kind of version of malloc and free, uh, shm get and shm control. And in the, in the middle, you have the attach and detach methods. And what those are is essentially functions to tell your operating system that you want to have a special chunk of memory, which can basically be shared among processes. So there are some limitations to that. Usually it depends on the configuration of your operating system. You can share an average, usually a few gigabytes, but you can up the number, you can reconfigure your OS to handle more like that. So th this kind of gives you actually a proper method to kind of allocate memory. And then you simply tell the other process, hey, here's the memory we want to share. And suddenly you have shared memory across processes. So this is kind of an amazing tool, but you still have to kind of put this into something. You have to wrap this uh, to make some proper use in Python. So I did a little proof of concept and uh, I will show you the code later, but bottom line is I wanted to have something like the P range from number uh, or for, from Siphon, but I wanted to have this in pure Python 
And I wanted to be able to share something like an umpire race or similar data structures so I could have my parallel computations. So I thought, hey, I need something simple like a decorator. You are familiar with them, that, I guess. And like an OpenMP, maybe I want to highlight what is a threat local variable and what is a shared variable. Like in this case, in line five, you can see I want to share the parameter parameter A that goes into the P range function. And then inside the function, I have a P range that actually splits uh, the Python interpreter into processes and then allows to do parallel computations. This is actually feasible in Python. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Now, why aren't people using doing that? And as it turns out, there are proper implementations for that. And this is kind of what I want to highlight here because from my perspective, this is kind of a forgotten niche in the ecosystem. So first of all, uh, the multiprocessing uh, kind of uh, library that is part of the pure Python vanilla standard library has a new addition, the shared memory module, which was added in Python 3.8. So this essentially allows you to have something like normal Python lists actually, uh, which are distributed across multiple Python interpreter sessions or processes. This is kind of amazing for normal Python. And if you are needing, if you're looking for arrays that are shared, there's actually also another package which does exactly that. It does kind of numpy arrays with all the kind of features that you are expecting. You can run your U func funks against them and do your stuff. And shared array is exactly this Python package which is doing this kind of thing. So now you can use multiprocessing, spin up multiprocesses on one machine, allocate a numpy array through shared array, and just spread it. And you suddenly are in a world of normal shared memory as if you were doing thread-based parallelism. And this is kind of a very, very neat thing to have for a lot of computation tasks. And you do not have to extend the Python interpreter in very bizarre and weird ways. And you do not have to care about the global interpreter lock. Very interesting application. I liked it very much. Uh, if you're interested in an actual proof of concept uh, demo all the way up from libc, from wrapping around NumPy, like how do you actually tell NumPy to use shared memory if you want to do it yourself, and how to have something like PRange manually, then I compiled a little gist for you. Otherwise, if you're interested in similar experiments, I do quite a bit of them, you can follow me on social media, like on Twitter, for instance, or you can just have a look at my GitHub profile. So thank you very much for your attention. My apologies for speaking so fast. It's okay. It's all good. It's, thank you so much. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, so, thank you so much for being here with us and for your presentation, Sebastian. You know, it's like sometimes if you have 10 minutes, then you want to speak so fast that you want to put everything that you have there inside. Yes. We go we got everything, so thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I would like, so we are running a little bit over on uh, time. So what I'm going to do is just speed up to the next speaker. I would like to introduce now Marek Supa. I'm going to talk about adapters, a neat and production enabling trick for multitask and multilingual NLP. Yeah, I don't like the title either. Thank you very much for, for using me. So I have about 30 slides, and uh, uh, that, that means we'll have about 10 seconds for each. Uh, I, 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 still, I still think uh, we can make it uh, rather nicely. So um, here's the thing. What do you do if you, it's not really a joke. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have prepared that way, but like we can probably spin it that way. What do you do if you want to solve in an LP task in 2021? Well, here's what I would do. I'd basically go to hugging, huggingface.co, CEO, um, check out if there is a model that could do what, what I would be into. Um, and if it solves a similar task, well, I mean, I mean, I'm basically golden. I uh, we, we I can probably use that. If not, well, we'll, we'll probably take some sort of a large pre-trained model uh, that uh, some large institution has spent quite a bit of time and resources on on, on training, and then we'll probably I will probably fine tune a couple of uh, uh, well small sp small parts of it such that it works nicely on my task, and. Uh, Perhaps if I if I felt a little bit if I had a bit more time or uh, or uh, if I wasn't really happy with what I saw I'd probably probably unfreeze a couple more uh, of its parts so that it learns at least a bit better and that's it that I would I would probably be be uh, be be done with that so well fairly straightforward in six um, in six steps you are pretty much done and you even have a bit of an optionality here in in three and four. 
Now, what do you do if you have a like a a, a problem, an NLP problem, meaning you do stuff with text, uh, with natural language, but that's not not really a single task you need, but a multi multiple tasks uh, that you need your your model or your um, final deployment to handle. Well, I would still go to to Hugging Face, check out the models there. I would still see if there is a trained model for something that's very similar to what I would like to do. And if not, well, again, uh, the the standard stuff uh, or like standard pre-trained models are always uh, a fairly good choice, at least at least to the first approximation. And now, depending on how many tasks uh, we are talking about, I probably go and and uh, and uh, see um, see if I could fine tune uh, at least the top parts of it for for this specific task. Well, and then I would repeat two to four, meaning these these three steps for all the tasks I would have. Now that's all good because at the end of the day, I would I would probably uh, figure it out this way. The problem is that if you take a something that's a little bit more complex than just a single or a or a couple of tasks, something like what we see on the on the image towards the bottom, which is a uh, basically a a chatbot processing engine, um, it starts to become quite a bit of a hassle. Mostly because for each of the tasks that we see in here, like recognizing the intent of a message or recognizing the entities that are perhaps being present in the, in the message, not to mention things like uh, recognizing um, part of speech and, and other interesting things that are normally standard in, in NLP pipelines. Well, each of these will be its own model and each of these will be of hundreds of megabytes in size. Meaning, in, in in total, we'll probably have a pretty big, pretty big to massive, massive package. Even if we go to to models that are distilled or uh, relatively small, such as TinyBird here. So the the answer, the thing I would like to show you in here that might be might be uh, um, able to to do something with that is what's called adapters. And the way adapters work is a very is a fairly straightforward uh, kind of a concept. Um, when you when you normally train uh, the the whole model, the whole transformer, as as you normally would, um, you basically go through all the weights that you that you uh, decide to decide to fine tune. In contrast, with adapters, most of the weights stay frozen, meaning they are not changed. But a smallish neural network gets inserted into the into specific parts of of the uh, of the architecture. And it is only these that are sort of encapsulated, as they call it, that get trained, that get updated. And but thanks to this, the the existing um, information that's that's basically been learned by the model can stay the way it was. What's nice about this is that this way we still get a a sense or a way for the models, for the final model, to be to be sort of uh, focused on our task and our specific data sets on our specific problems we have, but still not really um, kind of change the whole large model, whole large package. Now, getting back to the multitask problems, there is a couple of a couple of standard problems that uh, multitask learning or generally transfer learning has. So first thing is, if you if you throw a bunch of tasks at a sim uh, signal uh, and at the same model, there is a very, very strong chance you will and uh, encounter something like catastrophic inference, meaning the fact that there are um, multiple tasks this model needs to handle means that uh, that uh, it will have a hard time sort of figuring out what to focus on. Not to mention that this can be massively exacerbated by the fact that some tasks are more prominent than the others. You can also perhaps train your model sequentially, meaning you all you train it on one task, on the other task, and on the third, and so on and so forth. Problem there is what's called catastrophic forgetting. By the time you show it the third task, it's basically forgot what it was that it was solving in the in the task it it started with. And so for this, the adapters have a nicely nicely done concept, which is called adapter fusion, meaning you essentially learn a weighting in between adapters that are trained for specific tasks. And thanks to this, again, we are only changing smallish parts of those models. It's easier and faster to train. And but you um, as the as the experiments show, you get to a very similar performance as if you uh, you did it in uh, in the other uh, other ways we've been we've been talking about. So um, if you wanted to try something like this out, 
the the answer is adapter hub adapter hub.ml um there's a central repository of various of these pre-trained -pre adapter models and uh, uh the what what adapter transformers the package they they describe there actually does is that it's a it's a drop-in replacement for hugging face transformers. So if you use hugging face transformers in your in your current projects, there's a very large chance you could use adapter transformers as well. Simply install it and then use it very similarly to to how you would use uh, hugging face transformers. You only add a couple more calls in here, like load the specific adapters, set it to become active, and then from there on, uh, then from there on, you use the essentially the model the way you would use it um, if it if it didn't use adapters at all. The nice thing is that uh, although we are using the bird-based uncase, the, the standard model, the actual thing that got downloaded in here or like that would be that would be different is very small, it's just three megabytes and actually allows you to do state of the art sentiment uh, sentiment classification this way, provided you already have birds uh installed somewhere as well and so from there on it's a very straightforward it's basically the same thing um the same thing you would have done you would have done otherwise and if you want to train transformers that's a very similar story as well there are very little very few changes compared to the to the standard per pipeline the the only thing that's happening here is that we say yes please train the adapter that's called sst sst2 here that makes it so that everything else is frozen in the model and from there on, we basically only set the set the active adapters, just like previously, add the classification head and train the model the same way we would um, with hugging face, for, uh, hugging face transformers. Now, uh, the nice part, obviously, is that since we have a since we've added small bunch of uh, small bunch of um, kind of weights into the large model, we can also save them separately. And this allows us to have these sort of modular smallish models that we can stack on top or combine one with another um, within these uh, within these normally massive models uh, that would have otherwise uh, take quite a bit to learn, uh, sorry, quite a bit of, to, to train and generally to store and, and work with. So we can nicely say we can nicely save the adapters that have been trained to wherever we would want. Then you can learn way more on adapter hub uh, .ml. They also have quite a few of these pre-trained there as well. Now, I also wanted to point out at least very quickly that the adapters are being used in, in action despite being an open area of research. One of these, uh, one of the examples is called Trunkit. And Trunkit is essentially a spicy alternative. It's a way for you to do standard neural, uh, sorry, standard uh, natural language processing tasks. Um, of for multiple languages they have quite a few quite a few of them supported uh, roughly over over 50 of those the nice thing is that every single every single uh, part of or like every module it has is its own adapters meaning you only download one model the large uh, embird or something or xml uh, once and then you only download separate adapters for each of the languages meaning the resulting Deployment package, if you were to deploy it, is much smaller and much more manageable than if you had to have large models for every single language. And then using it is a very straightforward, as you would expect from something that aims to be a a, a framework. And so um, I guess I guess that's a that's a nice thing to try out if you ever are in a setup where you need multilingual natural language processing supported across multiple languages. And that's it. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Marek, for being with us uh, at Panita Global 2021. I would like now to hand over to John uh, Mac Cambridge, and he's going to talk about lightweight and automated exploratory data analysis. All right. So what I'm going to talk through here is a uh, very bare bones, um, easily modifiable, and very direct uh, lightweight uh, data analysis tool. Uh, for very simple exploratory data analysis. This is probably really helpful to contrast and compare with uh, what we saw from Diego Aida, um, in that this is designed for a use case that I constantly find myself in, which is when working with um, older firms uh, or uh, data systems, uh, let's say in financial services, um, or when working with a smaller, uh, rather non-technical uh, groups or organizations, often charities or NGOs, 
you won't necessarily have access directly to their database. Um, and you may also uh, find that they themselves don't really have uh, any useful ways for you to uh, work with the data apart from literally giving you a flat CSV or more likely an Excel that you might turn into a CSV. So the, uh, that challenge is one that uh, I would often deal with when, when helping these organizations. And I would find that I would always be doing the exact same thing, much as Diego said, I would do the same commands over and over again, trying to explore the data. Uh, and this is in the case where you're given a data file that not only have you never seen before, you have no real context for it. They might not even have a, 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 any kind of metadata available to you. They certainly won't have uh, data types, right? Because they're just providing you something out of uh, who knows what kind of system on their side. Uh, and so you have no context, metadata or otherwise, and it's very likely that the data itself is pretty messy and nasty and in ways that they probably don't even understand or can't tell you about. So what I wanted to do was set up something that would do what I have myself did constantly, which was poke at the data one uh, column at a time and try to figure out what was going on in each one of those as quickly as possible, but without ever letting the machine guess for me. I think that's one of the big differences I, I want to stress here uh, from some other systems you might use, which is at no point in time does uh, Flenser try to be smart. Uh, it will never try to help you by guessing anything at all. It will never impute anything. It will never assume anything. It will only provide you information that is factually guaranteed to be true inside of the data. And you'll see that as we, as we go forward in here. So the way it executes is incredibly simple. Uh, you get access to your data file, you run uh, the uh, Python script, and it's customizable in a very simple way, which is it allows you to specify uh, um, uh, NA values that you know for sure are NA values. That's one of the few things you might find uh, you are told, or it's something that when you do your first run with Flenser, you immediately find some of these common NA values that are often non-standard. You can then just integrate those in with the command line and you'll have a much cleaner uh, experience when you run it the second time. So um, let me just show you uh, what happens. You were given a file, let's say these two files that are spread across uh, the internet, but more likely you're given something from some local partner you're working with. Uh, you execute in your command line as simple as possible, right? You just uh, execute the script. You can specify your NAs. It's a list if you like. Um, and then it will just try to open a simple HTML file that it will generate itself. And so here is an example of one of those files. Um, there are no visuals in here. The idea is to provide you with raw information that you can then interpret yourself. Uh, so it immediately tells you the really high level stuff you need to know about rows and columns. It tells you all the NANs it searched for, and it tells you how many of them it actually found. This is incredibly helpful because often you'll be told, oh yeah, we use this NAN value. You search for it and actually it turns out that doesn't appear anywhere in the data set and it's something else. It then shows you every single column and tells you which tests were triggered. Uh, inside of the code, which I'll show you shortly, you can find all of these tests and they're incredibly easy to customize. And they do very, very simple things and then provide you with information. Again, the idea is to try to just provide you with raw facts about what's going on in the data. It'll also tell you quickly what NANs are found per column. So in some cases, there are none. In some cases, there are literally empty cells. And in others, you see a, a true well-formed uh, uh, NA. And then for each of the columns, you literally are just scrolling down. This is a completely flat output. You scroll down, you're told the uh, column name as the header, which tri tests triggered. And then based on these tests, really simple diagnostic outputs. So for example, since uh, it's going to check for unique values and tell you the count and tell you the share of non-AN, NANs, right? So this will allow you to know, okay, how many of my values are uh, both uh, non-AN NAN, and unique. This is incredibly useful because it allows you, as was discussed before, to provide, uh, find, say, primary key columns and so on. It will then show you a random selection of values without replacement, uh, just to give you some flavor of what these are. Uh, and then it will tell you, you know, how many NANs did we find? How many of the non-ANs are unique? All of them. Can it therefore function as a unique identifier? And if so, what would be the first value in there? You can immediately start to see, oh, interesting, there, this is only four digits long, and yet we're seeing random samples that are five digits long, and there's no leading zero. So right away, you're starting to see stuff in the data set 
that you will need to be keeping in mind about, well, this is a unique identifier, yet it has no leading zeros, so it's non-consistent in its distribution. And then you have, since these are numeric, a nice, simple quartile range output, showing you mins and counts and so on. It'll then just move on to the next column. So again, you just immediately start being able to walk through here and start seeing what are these actually about? We have ident, we have type, and you're starting to see information that will hopefully let your own brain to make decisions about what any of this actually is. We right away found that this is a very simple uh, categorical list, which we can then ourselves decide whether or not we want to declare to be categorical based on what we're seeing in the output. And the idea is you simply scroll right on through, you'll come across things like this. This is called latitude deg, so you might imagine it's latitude in degrees, yet let's actually see what are the outputs. And you can actually check in here that you're seeing interesting outputs, including rather strange ones like a true minus 90. Uh, and uh, you, as you scroll through the data file, you'll just get more and more information. Some of the columns will immediately start to reveal themselves to you, like this one, in which there are really just two values, uh, a handful of values, and you can just see the examples here. Um, and you can start making connections yourself about what any of this actually means. Um, you also see some custom tests in here. For example, detect, trying to detect if these are Salesforce IDs. It's a very common thing in which you yourself might be working with the data set where you know that there's likely to be Salesforce IDs, possibly because it literally came out of a Salesforce system. But your team that you're working with, the people providing it to you, might not know where the Salesforce IDs appear, or there might be random columns that are ID columns they've forgotten about. And so this will do tests to try to find those for you. In this case, you can see, though, it's wrong. These aren't Salesforce IDs, which you can know yourself uh, by looking at them. So it hasn't presumed to tell you they're Salesforce IDs. It just tells you they might be. And this is a, the way that you can use it. You just scroll through. And now, having read through it over a couple of minutes, you're able to make your own decisions about what any of these are. And then you can move forward with much more complex analyses or work as you see fit. And you can see that it'll work on file, files that are you know, relatively large in size. It's all running locally. So that's part of the design. It's not. It's a situation in which all you've been given is a local file, possibly dropped to a SharePoint or to your uh, email. Uh, and you're basically told, hey, can you help us with this? Uh, and from there, you've got to start doing something constructive to help them out. You can immediately start seeing things here, for example, like how this file, which should be relatively well formatted, nonetheless is inconsistent NAs appearing throughout it. That alone is a big step forward if you're working with a relatively technically unadvanced organization where they're just struggling to understand their basics of their data set. Uh, and then I'll finish here just by showing you uh, some basics in the code itself. It's obviously kept simply as a single script, so it's incredibly easy to edit. Um, and one of the simple things that you can see here is that you can set up more complex functions to run special tests for you. And then you just populate tests in here in a data class. So if you wanted to add a new test, all you have to do is just pop it in here into this list of tests and it will run and execute for you. And these tests can be as complicated or with using functions or as simplistic as you like, in which you know, you're just basically doing what are essentially the kinds of things you would type by hand yourself when exploring a data set. The idea though is that every single test uh, will do a check. If the check is true, it will output some kind of output for that specific column. So every single column gets every single test applied against it. Uh, and this is Flemser. Uh, it's easy to use, uh, and I'd be happy, easy to extend, uh, and easy to get onto your system. All you need is Python uh, and the ability to clone a single Git repo, uh, and you're good to go. So I'd be happy to take any questions with whatever time there is left. There are questions. Thank you so much, John. We have 30 seconds left from uh, Zazidar. Is Flemser a Python package available at PyPy? If not, how can I install it? Nope. So right now, this is as simple as it literally exists as a Python script that you can download from Git. Uh, it hasn't even been packaged up. You can see that here. The idea was to just keep this as incredibly simplistic as possible. Um, if people find that it's difficult for them to get access to it in their a particular situation, unless it's elsewhere, uh, do please let me know in the chat and uh, we can talk about that. It would be interesting to know if that's a barrier to people. My hope was by keeping it as simple as literally a single script you execute at the command line um, after cloning the repo, uh, that that would actually make it as accessible as possible. But I'm really open to, to hearing otherwise. Thank you so much, John, for being with us at PyData Global. Thank you.
I would like Thank to you. hand over now to Christopher uh, Lozinski. That's, that's the last talk for the day. And it's an introduction to the current information war. Hi, Christopher Lozinski here. I run uncensorednews.us. I put the link in the chat. Um, I hope you can see my camera. Um, so we're in the middle of uh, both national and international information wars for our hearts and minds. In the US, the 2020 election spending uh, was $14 billion. I presume you can see the shared screen. Um, corporations literally get a great ROI on their lobbying and campaign contributions. Internationally, the military organizations are starting to get involved. Here's the French military strategy in English and in French. Uh, here you can hear about NATO's policies and um, Canada does it. They're not the only ones. How do they do it? Let's examine the whole information flow chain from the news source to the journalist, through the network, through social media, and how it gets to you, the reader. Once we've understood the problem, it's easy to then free ourselves, at least from the algorithms and bots. News starts with a source. In the US, some whistleblowers are not treated well, causing other whistleblowers to self-censor. Next, the news gets to the reporters. Reporters Without Borders reports that 50 journalists were killed in 2020. Uh, 387 journalists are currently detained in connection with their work, and how many more are intimidated into self-censorship or a different career? Then the news has to cross the networks. There have been multiple cases of countries shutting down their entire network. According to the Keep It On Coalition, in 2020, 29 countries around the world reported to shutdowns with 33 in 2019 and 25 in 2018. Then we get to the proprietary algorithms that determine what we see. In 2017, the World Socialist website began documenting that it, along with other leftist and progressive outlets, had suddenly experienced a dramatic drop in traffic from Google searches. This was later confirmed by the Google CEO. Uh, here we have the YouTube CEO saying they, they will actively prioritize corporate videos over alternative news media. And here's one honest billionaire uh, stating that he bought Politico for propaganda purposes. You can read more about censorship by Silicon Valley, by the mainstream media, and by the US government. You also have to worry about the bots. There are many open source Reddit bots and Twitter bots. I suspect there are also some very sophisticated proprietary bots we did not know about. We also have people being kicked off of social media. While you may not like him, Many international leaders, including Angela Merkel, were appalled that President Trump was kicked off of Facebook and Twitter without any due process. The 2020 Green Party candidate was kicked off temporarily from Twitter. How many others have been deplatformed without or even noticing? Or worse yet, have their traffic throttled by the proprietary algorithms? What can be done about this? Substack provides a commercial solution. You subscribe to newsletters either for free or as a paying subscriber. The journalists then publish both free and paid newsletters. It includes great writers like Glenn Greenwald, Caitlin Johnstone, Matt Stoller, and Matt Taibbi. Glenn Greenwald knows the Substack staff personally and trusts them. They're of course closed source and practice surveillance capitalism. Ghost.org is another great solution. It is, run, it is used by my favorite political commentator, Bernie Sanders speechwriter, David Sirota's Daily Poster. Glenn Greenwald has now started to use Rumble, and my favorite podcast, The Dark Horde Podcast, uses odyssey.com, having been demonetized by YouTube for challenging COVID orthodoxy. Of course, there are many websites with great content, but no email newsletter, but you can access both Substack and most website articles using an RSS reader. RSS is an ancient technology for accessing the newest articles from your favorite websites. The problem is that then you get flooded with articles, many of which are junk. I can't do anything about murders, imprisonment, or networks going out, but it's quite easy to beat the algorithms, bots, and deep platforming. Uncensored News Not US does this. Um, it pulls in, uh, these are the recommended articles uh, that, so that I read and recommend. Uh, here you can see the newest articles. Uh, some of them may not be so good. You can also see the different categories and click into, for example, climate change and see the articles there. You can take a look at the RSS feeds. So please visit uncensorednews.us. Please follow Uncensored News on mastodon.social. And this is about a five minute talk, even with a minute delay at the front. So we should have time for some questions. Thank you.
thank you so much. That's, I think, a close for our Lightning Talks today. Thank you, everyone, for being here uh, with us. I thank you so much, all the speakers. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you so much, everyone.